Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to get started here. It's just about four o'clock and I'll admit more people as they come and join later. Um, I'd like to welcome all to another Sun River U class. We're very happy you're taking these classes. This is the second in a series we've um, started doing on legacy and retirement planning. The first one was last week, which was estate planning and um, figuring out your fiduciaries. Um, this one is on how to safely grow your retirement, mainly focusing on annuities. And then next Tuesday, we'll have our third in the series, which is um, called Beyond Check Put Philanthropy. Philanthropy, excuse me, <laughs> I can't talk. Um, anyway, um, hope you'll enjoy uh, one, two, or all three of them. If you haven't joined the third one, you can still join that one if you go to Sun River U website and go to the link and register for that class if you wish to join that one as well. Um, today we have Karen Brannan. She's, she grew up on a farm in Nebraska and also lived in Colorado, California, Florida before moving to Central Oregon. Um, they've lived here for about 15 years, completed her undergraduate work at University of Nebraska and her MBA from the University of Northern Colorado. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, after she moved here, um, she became an agent for Farmers Insurance, which is what she's done for the last 15 years. Um, focusing on property casualty, casualty and life, life licenses and has a 663 securities license, which I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Maybe she can explain. Um, they have offices in Bend and Lapine and they're licensed in Oregon, Washington, California and Idaho. Um, she's very passionate about educating people, making sure they understand how to manage their risks um, and she's been doing this for a while. And today's presentation is going to focus on indexed annuities. Um, she's going to talk about how they can use, be used to safely grow your retirement money um, and explain some of the questions we might all have about them. Um, I know she has a lot to say. I'm going to let her get going. One thing after, if you have questions, please enter the questions into the chat. They'll come directly to me. And then at the end of her presentation, we will answer all the questions that you have at that time. Um, thank you very much. And Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, and hopefully I will be able to do screen sharing completely um, uh, without problem here. Okay, there we go. I'm assuming everyone can see it. Um, Yes, so, thanks. So to answer your question about six and 63 license, there's several different levels of security license. I'm licensed to sell mutual funds, not stocks directly. Um, that's kind of the difference. But this isn't an investment product that I'm talking about. And that's why this first screen is a little um, titillating in the, you already insure your home and your auto, why not insure your retirement? And the reason I say that because annuities are an insurance product, not an investment product. Um, there's reasons that's important, and I'll go over that in a little bit with you. Um, so let's talk about the history of money preservation. First of all, there's, there's two phases to collecting money for retirement. There's the accumulation phase, and that's where we start, you know, when we're in our 30s, hopefully, and until we retire, we grow our money as much as we can. Um, <clears throat> most of us are now in the distribution stage or the preservation stage. The important thing is that if we don't have our money growing at all, it's going to lose value with inflation. Um, I remember my parents talking about, you know, the great 70s and 80s where you would just go out and you would buy a CD or you would buy a government bond and put your money there. And it was growing at a much higher rate than inflation was growing. So you were able to continue to grow your money. Um, once the interest rate um, kind of fell out of the bottom of everything. And, and that was pretty much in 2008 when everything else fell out. You know, we ended up with a very low interest rate. And what happened then was our traditional places to put our money when we're near retirement or in retirement 
didn't make a lot of sense, you know? I mean, you all see how much money you get on bank interest, right? So the CD, even if you make a five to 10 year commitment, you're going to be getting maybe 2%. Same with government bonds. You're not gonna get as much as inflation. So um, it really is a matter of losing money slowly or putting your money in the stock market and risking that your time horizon is too short. And time horizon is just a fancy way of saying the time between when you put it there and when you need the money is not long enough for it to recover if there's a downturn in the market. So people were between, between a rock and a hard place. And you know, as American ingenuity always goes, if there's a need, someone's going to come along and find a way to meet that need. So along came life insurance. Um, the reason that annuities are a life insurance product is that they use actuary tables to determine how money will be distributed if it's annuitized. Um, you know, annuities are not a new idea. This is how pensions have been funded from the beginning of time. That's how they were invented when company pensions were the normal thing. You worked somewhere for the rest of your life and then they gave you a certain amount of money. Um, and that's where the idea of annuities came from. Um, but this is the next generation of annuities. You can still get annuities that act as a full pension and do all those fancy things and you can annuitize and have money for the rest of your life or the rest of your life and someone else's life. That product is still available. That's not what I'm really gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about some of the new things that the industry is introducing. Now, I'm not gonna talk about specific brands or products and features and differences. I'll talk about in general with those things, but really my goal today is to help everybody kind of understand how this fits into a retirement plan. Doesn't fit into everybody's plan, but it could fit into a lot of people's plans. Um, so the things that, you know, that we didn't like about the old annuities and we hear a lot about are the, um, um, the things that we don't like is that there was fees, um, you were locked in for life, that um, you had to annuitize it to get your money out. Uh, there was downside, you know, not downside protection. Um, the way that these work, it really is very similar to what a CD would do or a um, bond account. You put money in for a certain amount of time, it grows, and that part is the indexing, which we'll go into in just a little minute, what that means in terms of indexing for interest as opposed to just having an interest percentage. Um, but uh, most of the time there are no fees unless you buy riders, not everybody needs riders. And if you do, then the fees probably are acceptable. Um, one of the nice benefits that's not true in, uh, it's true in some bonds, not true in CDs, that the money grows tax deferred. So once you put your money into an, an annuity, uh, the growth of it is not taxed until it's withdrawn. So it's going to grow faster because you're not paying taxes every year on the growth. Um, and most people honestly never annuitize their annuities. The people buying annuities now are looking for a safe place to put their money and let it grow for a few years. Um, almost all of them have a withdrawal schedule after the first year of at least 10% where you can take money out, uh, whether it's qualified money or not. Um, but the, what I was talking about, about it being life insurance, one of the really cool things about this, because you know we love that the bank has FDIC where our CDs are protected in the bank. Well, insurance has something very similar to that. It's not a federal program, it's a state program, but every state insurance commission has a state fund to deal with insurance companies that might go default. So say you bought an annuity from somebody and they defaulted, which hasn't happened in a long time, but doesn't mean it can't. There is a fund at the state insurance office that will pay just like the FDIC fund pays. So it really does have a guarantee against the, the institution um, going out of business, uh, the state will pay uh, just like they do with the FDIC. And that's, and that's the part that makes the insurance piece of it most attractive because now we've, we've um, eliminated fees in most cases. And, and um, because it's in an index, and I think I'll just go on to the next screen, um, the magic of indexing, the way indexing works, it, it started with they were just Instead of saying I have this percentage of, end up, uh, of interest that the annuity company would pick a market index, the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, one of those indexes and say, okay, 
we're going to use that as the bench stone of how much money you're going to make. Um, and it's still interest because your money is not going to be invested in the S&P 500. And I'm just gonna use that as my example throughout this discussion. Um, it's going to just mirror that. So whatever the S&P 500 does, you will get a percentage of that growth which is gonna be more than the one or 2% that you're gonna get in interest. Now, what happens if the S&P 500 goes down that year? Well, most of these products lock in the amount every year. So say you had a good year last year and you got four or 5% uh, added to your account. And this year it went down 10%. You stay exactly where you were last year. You don't go down with it. So once it's locked in at the end of the year, the amount stays the same. And then the next year, if it goes down, it stays the same and then it goes back up. Um, one of the simple concepts of growth of money is that if you don't have any downturns, you need less upturns. Because every time you lose 10%, you have to make 20% to get back up to where you were. So if you never lose that 10%, then you don't have to make money to get back to where you were. Uh, it makes the, the numbers a little more attractive because you're not going to make as much money doing this as you do in the stock market, but you're going to wait way more than in an interest-based product. Um, the method for calculating the percentage of growth can get a little difficult to understand. I'm going to go into it briefly and please ask questions if you have any. There's basically two ways they do it. They have a, either a cap rate. Let's say on the S&P 500, they're going to cap it at 8%, anything over 8% the company gets, anything from zero to 8% you get. So they take the cap, everything above the cap. Another method they use is participation rate, which is usually somewhere in the 80 and 90 percentile. Um, you, only get the per you only get what the S&P did for 80% of your money. You don't get it for all of it. Well, why do they do that? Because that's how they make money. They, they aren't charging any fees. They're paying the, the person who's selling it to you. So you're not paying any fees to your um, insurance agent or to your um, broker, whoever you're buying it from. And um, they're paying me and you're not paying me. And that's important because when you're buying you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, it works opposite of that. Um, but um, let's see, totally lost track of what I was gonna say next. So give me a second. <laughs> Um, so you don't need to have as much up, upside when you don't have any downside. Um, and that's, that's the critical piece there. And, and as I alluded to, how do the annuity companies make their money? Well, um, they take their money and invest it in whatever index that they're using to determine your money. So when the index goes up, you get 8%, they get 15% or whatever the numbers end up being. So that's the money they get. They also do... Um, things where they buy options for downsides. So if it goes down, they buy those things where they can make money if that goes down. And that's what protects them so that they don't lose their shirts on the bottom side. So it, it's, it is a, quite a dance to watch how they construct these. And, and some of them are getting very intricate. Uh, just because it's intricate, it doesn't mean it's any better. But the important part of this is that um, you don't um, invest your money in the stock market, you can never end up with less money than you started with. Um, and this is why it is a good space holder for money. It's not money that you need immediately. It certainly is not for all of your money, but it's a way you can grow your money safely and outpace um, what the inflation rate is. It's, it's positioning itself in the market to do exactly what um, the old CDs and, you know, investing in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all those, uh, or was he a country singer? I don't know. <laughs> but I remember all the adults would talk about, you know, their bond investment, their government bonds. That's how you go. And, and, and the whole purpose that the industry has come up with this is to do exactly that. But it, there is, you know, they make you commit to a time. Um, I have several companies I work with, and they're anywhere from three to seven years usually. Uh, the longer you commit your money, the longer you know the more money you're going to get in your cap and in your participation rate because that gives them a longer time to use your money um, to have it grow. And, and here's the things that you need to remember about an annuity. Um, if you liquidate it before the surrender schedule is over, you will have a penalty just like you would in a CD. 
Um, now, you can do withdrawals, um, particularly, you know, for people who are needing to do mandatory, you know, withdrawals. Uh, but even if you want to, you can withdraw. Usually it's 10% a year with no penalties. So you do have access to some of the money. It certainly isn't a place you want to put all your money for that very reason. You don't have the liquidity you do with other products. Um, <clears throat> And there is tax consequences if you withdraw before you're 59 and a half. So this is not a product for the accumulation phase of your retirement. It's not a product for a 40 year old who doesn't have much savings. Um, it is really designed for people who are nearing retirement age who have less than a 10 year time horizon before they need the money. That's really the position that it needs to be placed in when you think about, is this right for me? Um, it's not right for everybody, and, and people still have a lot of thoughts about, you know, well, annuities are just too complicated as smoke and mirrors. Those certainly exist, but there's ones that are super simple as well. Um, you can't add to the investment once you purchase an annuity. If you like the idea of the annuity and like what it's doing, you'll have to purchase another one. There are minimum investment requirements. Most of them are at least... 10 to 15,000, some of them are 25,000. So um, you wanna make sure you've thought out how much you wanna do the first time so that you can get the money you want in it. In it. Um, and um, you do not need to annuitize your investment. You know, after the end of the three years, you decide you're done, then you just withdraw your money, pay your taxes that have been deferred uh, for that period of time on your gains and move it on to the next investment. You can annuitize it. I, it really isn't. The, these were not a designed to be lifetime annuities. They're designed to be a solution for a fixed period of time for your money to grow safely above the rate of inflation. That is all they were designed to do. Um, and they still have some of the bells and whistles, but very few of them. And it's the bells and whistles that are expensive um, on any annuity. Um, but these don't have a lot of those because it really is just a, a safe harbor for your money to grow. Um, so, you know, who, who should consider um, having an annuity? Here's how I think about it. Um, if you, you, you should have more liquid money available to, for the next five years of your life, you shouldn't put money you're going to need to spend in the next five years into an annuity. Um, you know, you can certainly tap into it, but if you have an emergency, that's, you're going to lose money doing that. Um, and also if you're younger, you know, it's not a really good idea. So you really should be in your fifties, um, and, and looking at this as I always look at money as buckets, you know, there's the immediate bucket. It needs to be very liquid and very safe. So you're not going to make much money on that. An index annuity is perfect for the middle bucket, that 10 to 20 year money. Eh, or even five to 10 year money. You know, you, you, it has to be kind of safe because you don't have enough time to recover from the market. And then all your money for over 10 years, you know, that needs to grow even faster because the biggest problem Americans have is out, outliving their money, not, um, not having enough money. Um, that, and that's most people's fear. So, you know, if you're looking at a 10 year time horizon for the rest of your money, then you can be a little more aggressive with that. Um, this works really well if you have a lump sum inheritance or maybe money from a house that you're not going to reinvest and you just want to set it aside. You know, I was mentioning earlier that my, my mother's house um, was destroyed in a house fire and we found out her house is worth twice as much burnt down as it was standing. That's rural Nebraska for you. And uh, so we're doing some investment in a long-term annuity for my retirement. I'm going to try not to touch it till I'm 80 and then I'm going to do a stream of, of money out of that. Um, so they work really well for that. Um, and it's a good place to put so you can grow tax deferred because again, you don't have to have as high of, of interest rate if you don't have any downside and you don't have any taxes that you're paying on it while it's in the product. Um, it's also a good way to preserve money for your children and your grandchildren to just leave it in the annuity. Every time that the annuity matures in that three, five, seven year plan, um, you have the choice of just leaving it there or taking it out. You can leave it in there for as long as you want um, without any restrictions around that. Um, so, you know, I look at it as just another tool in the tool shed. Um, not everybody likes the idea of annuities. There's been a, a lot of really bad annuity products out there, um, but, but it has a place. Um, there is a need to have people 
have a way to invest uh, where, where they don't have to worry. Um, some people just feel like they have enough money that they're going to risk the market, and that's a perfectly acceptable strategy. It really depends on how risk averse you are. How, how willing are you to take the risk to grow more money? Because, you know, the more money you're going to make, the riskier the product's going to be. That's just kind of the, how it works. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to open it up to questions because this is a complicated subject. It's kind of hard to give it all in two seconds. So I'm hoping people have questions and I can drill down on some of these comments, con concepts a little more for you. Um, hi, we have, we have one question here. Are, okay. are annuities used by high net worth investors due to their tax deferred nature? That, that is one of the groups that does use them, yes. Um, and it just really depends on what, again, what you're using it for. But, but it is not just for, you know, the, the lower echelon of investors. Um, I have several people that I know that, you know, have million dollar in assets and still have a portion in annuities because it's going to be, a, you know, that everything falls out of the market. The world falls apart. All your investments in the stocks and bonds are down in the toilet for a while. You can always annuitize it and have a stream of income. Um, and it will always be there in a safe kind of way. So I, I would say it's more about what, how risk adverse you are, how, how much you're able to tolerate risk and still sleep at night, and uh, what your long-term plans for the money are. You know, um, if, you, if, you want to, if you want to use it, um, you know, say for your children, it's money you don't think you're going to need, it's a perfect place to put it. Um, if, if you, you know, like I say, I like it for that five to 10 year bucket, what am I going to, you know, I've got my safe money over here that I'm not making anything on, but I've got, you know, five to 10 years because cyclically the stock market recovers at, at, in the least 10 years. Uh, there's never been a time in the history of the stock market that 10 years after a terrible crash, it wasn't back to better than it was before. So the industry kind of uses that as the, you know, bench stone for, you know, if you have less than a 10 year time horizon, you need to be a little careful about what you do with your money. Uh, it needs to be something that you can get at regardless of uh, what the market's doing and, and not have to suffer the consequence of taking money out in a down market. So with the annuity in that middle place, it's just a safe place that money can still grow more than the, first, the one to five year money, um, but you know it's safe and you know it's gonna be there in five years when that becomes your one to five year money. So I think looking at buckets makes it easier. Okay, another question. What is the current rate of return for a new annuity right now? On an indexed annuity, um, they're running four to 6%. I mean, 6% at the very top. I think, you know, three and a half, four and a half percent is a reasonable amount to expect. Um, and, and they're making more and more choices on how you can invest in these, you know, what, what products you can, um, you know, what, what the indexes are. They're not going just with the standard like the S&P, they're creating their own indexes and it's getting quite complicated. Um, so, you know, it, I would say 6% is the cap at the most you could hope for. And it's probably more realistic to say three and a half to 5% is where it usually would land. But again, you have no downturns. So if you miss a year of the upside, you're still gonna stay at the same place you were at. Um, there's some interesting charts available that show um, how that would, you know, long-term work, that the difference between what you would have to make in the market, taking into account up and down sides versus in an index annuity where you only take the upside and you never have to take the downside and your investment is safe. You're never going to walk away with less than you put in to start. Okay. Um, you kind of answered this earlier in the presentation, but we had a question here about what is the average commission? Um, uh, I think it's about 3%. I would say it's about average. But again, that is paid by the annuity company. It's not paid by you. So you give them $10,000 to start your annuity. And um, they give me my 2 to 4%. And um, you still have your $10,000 in your annuity. They're paying me which is different than how it works in stocks. You know, you have a sales charge there and, and they're, you know, you're paying for that. So, and it, it, it's a one-time commission for the sale. And, but that's a really good question. How do they get paid? Because they, 
they make their money taking everything above um, where their cap is and spread is, and um, that's how they make their money. And, and they, they apparently do it really well because there are so many people getting into this business. When I for, when they was first introduced to me, I think it was about six years ago, we had one company that we worked with because Farmers doesn't brand their own products. We work with other fun companies. We work with AIG, we work with Voya, we work with, um, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it, Athene is another one we work with, uh, Axis. So uh, we're we're just selling other people's products as, as anyone in the industry typically does. Um, but now we have so many different choices um, compared to what we used to have. And you can still do a straight interest-based one, uh, but I usually don't recommend that. And, you know, it, it, you're not gonna get anything with straight interest, but um, uh, I love the indexing because it gives you everything about growing your money, you know, using the, the, the leverage in the, the market rates without risking your money. And that's where people over 50 need to be. So another question, um, how exactly does annu annuitization, sorry, annuitization um, work to create an income stream? Okay, well, so when you annuitize, which is a choice you have at the end, you know, once you've made it through your, um, your initial years, you can say, okay, now I want, I want you to annuitize this. And in the process of annuitizing, they're looking at the same, again, the same actuary tables that they look at for life insurance, figure out what your life expectancy is. You have to decide, do you want it for your life only or your life and your spouse's life? Or do uh, you want it for the next 10 years, not necessarily your whole life? There's a lot of different ways you can annuitize. And then they figure out through the actuary tables what you would get every year. And then you start getting a, monthly or annual check for that amount uh, for life. It's, it's a lifetime payment, even though you may not have as much money in there as um, you're gonna end up getting, that's what annuitization is about. Um, the challenge comes with how to annuitize. Who do you wanna include? What if you die a year after you get it? I mean, that's where some of the horror stories come in with these. Uh, and certainly if you are buying one for the purposes of a lifetime stream of income, then that's something that, you know, you have to put a lot of thought into. Uh, and, 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 and I think that's a, a good way to have a steady flow, even though you have a, a, a nice portfolio of investments, you have this one piece that's going to give you a steady income forever. And um, that's, you know, but again, most people aren't doing that in today's day and age because they're looking for that replacement to the CD. And that really is where this fits in the market. Um, there are fancy pantsier annuities than the indexed annuities. There's variable annuities, there's fixed annuities. There's all kinds of annuities. Um, but again, this, this is what I want to talk about today because I think this is the one that's most confusing for people that, you know, you get the growth, but you don't get, um, you don't have any downturn. Um, if it levels out, you know, here you're you're going to look like this. First year goes up, next year level, next year up. So instead of you know getting 10% the first year, going down 5%, and needing 10% to get back up the next year, you're going to be the same place that that person was by just going up 5% because you didn't go down. So your great your gain does not need to be as large when you're not having any downside that you have to make up for. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, part of what you just said a little bit. Uh, what is what happens to your annuity uh, upon your death? Well, again, it depends on which what you chose. If you choose just you, um, and just like a pension, think of it as a pension. Is it basically when you annuitize it, it has become your pension. And uh, if you choose it for you and your wife, then your wife will get it until she dies. If you choose it just for you and you die three months after you put it into place, it, they get to keep it all. Um, if you choose to do it for just the next 10 years, because then you've got another source of income coming in at the end of that 10 years, it goes away. You get to choose just like if you were going to go into a pension, how you want to settle that. Um, the, the way you get the most money is just your life, but most people do it for the, the both spouses, you know, so that you get, um, a share of the other spouses. Um, but there's, Yeah. They, they get to keep whatever's left. And if you live longer than you're supposed to, you get more money than you should have. <laughs> so, sorry, just to ask, I'm asking this to go on with that question. 
if you have a beneficiary to your annuity upon your death, do they just get whatever principal is left in there? Or Most of them are designed that way. Yes, there's not a general rule around that for the beneficiaries, and and uh, but but not if it's been annuitized. Once it's annuitized, then they don't get it. So the beneficiary comes into play before it's annuitized. In most cases, I can't say universally that's true, but that's that's how it's designed, and that's why most people don't annuitize it because they're not looking at it as, because you can withdraw from it. I mean, you know, most of these, you can withdraw 10% a year without any penalty other than paying the taxes on the gain. And you then, if you die, your beneficiary gets it. But once it's annuitized, you're locking in um, how you want that to be paid out. You're saying, yep, I'm okay if you just pay until I die, whenever that might be. And, and then honestly, that's, one of the reasons it's kind of gotten a bad rap. I mean, we all probably know some government employee who, you know, two two months or two years after they retired, they died. And, um, you know, that whole pension that they worked their whole life for went away. Now, a government employee doesn't have any choice but to annuitize. Well, they can. They can cash out and do their own investing. But um, I think that's probably the biggest reason that you don't see a lot of annuitization because it doesn't give you flexibility at death. Okay, I'm moving on to another one. Uh, we have a few questions here, so I'm kind okay. of moving forward. If a person has a portfolio that is 75, 25 stocks to bonds and has no obvious need for the funds in the near term, does it make sense to replace the bonds with annuities? I, I, I can't give investment advice without knowing the a person's risk tolerance and those kinds of things. It's, it's not really within the scope of what I'm doing here. Um, I can get in trouble with FINRA if I start answering those kind of questions. Okay, I'll move on then. Um, okay, uh, be happy to have a private conversation with anybody about that. And um, you can find me in any phone book on any billboard in any newspaper. But I have blonde curly hair in those pictures. Okay. <laughs> Are they taxed as capital gains or as ordinary income? Um, good question. I knew this. I'm trying to remember. Um, it's taxed as, I think, capital gains. I'm pretty sure. Uh, no, well, no, I think I, I, I defer to your accountant. I, I, I think I'm, I'm not sure on that, but I could Google it really fast and find out. <laughs> this may or may not be a question you can answer also, but I'll read it anyway. What type of economic or market conditions are best for investing in an annuity? I understand individuals' risks adverse going for CDs or annuities versus the stock market, but are there economic indicators that would point people toward investing in annuities? Well, the way I look at it, and I can't answer this one, I look at the, the volatility of the market. I mean, right now we're in the longest bear market that there's been. I, it seems like the entire time I've been in this business, it's like, yeah, it's going to crash, you know, the seven year cycle. And now what are we on year 12 of the seven year cycle or something? But, you know, there's a lot of instability in the world. And I think, you know, when you're looking, if you're, this is really for the people who are having trouble sleeping at night, wondering what they're going to wake up to in the stock market the next day. Um, and if you want to hedge against, you know, the worst case scenario, and there's a couple of really bad years, you know, I think that's, you know, I think it has more to do with your risk tolerance uh, than anything else, you know, and, and the way I look at what, I mean, you know, I looked at how much the market went down this morning and I just, uh, you know, <laughs> it probably will go back up tomorrow. You know, it, it probably has already. I haven't looked at it midday. Um, but for a lot of people, that uncertainty of what the market's going to do is um, a big stress point. And I would say for those people, it makes sense. Uh, if you're a really savvy investor and you're watching you know, what the market's doing and you're comfortable with where you are, it may not be for you. Um, I, I think it's for the people who just don't wanna be afraid. Okay, another one. Do you have to lock in gains every year? And what if you don't? Well, you want to because it's like a win. It's like, okay, so you rolled the, you went to the casino and you put in your money and you got your $50 and uh, take the $50 out and start over because you get to keep the $50. If you don't lock it in, then what would happen is that if the market goes down, you would lose that $50. I think all these products lock in annually, 
um, but it's designed for your best interest to lock in because whatever the gain was that year, you lock in, and then the next year you lock in the next gain. So if there's a down year between the two up years, there's no consequences to the money you have. If there wasn't a lock-in, then it would just be going up and down. Because uh, again, I can't stress enough that if your portfolio goes down 5%, you have to make 10% to get back to where you were before your portfolio went down. So if you never go down that 5%, um, that's a beautiful thing. Okay, one more here. Um, what is a way to approach the insurance agent selling the indexed annuity to go through the numerous choices to help pick the best choice for our needs? Um, well, I would, I would find somebody who's been doing it for a while. You know, I think that that experience is the best uh, option. Um, I, I mean, what I do, you know, I, I fully admit I am a generalist. I am not an expert in any field. I know a lot about a lot of things, but not everything. And what I usually do is I go out to the wholesalers that I work with and talk to them about what my clients needs are and and listen to them and i ask for other expert opinions i would be really hesitant to work with somebody who thinks they know everything because <laughs> they probably don't so i would shop for somebody who is willing to do the legwork i mean whenever you get a new client and you're doing this kind of work it takes some time to put together the pieces and figure out what you think you should recommend and how that should look and so I would, you know, find somebody who can, you know, either verbally or in writing, uh, they're required to show you why this would work for you and what the upsides are and the downside. And if they can't have that conversation, you're probably not buying it from the right person. If they can't explain it in a way you can understand it, then they don't know it well enough to sell it to you. I'll just say that. Great. Um, that was the last question we've received. Uh, if any of the rest of you have a question, please type it into the chat. And I'll ask it right now. Otherwise, we're going to kind of wrap this up, I think. Um, yeah. Do you have any final things to say, Karen? No, like I say, if anybody wants to have a conversation, I always say talking to me about your money is free. I love to have conversations with people and just give them my opinion. I never charge for consultation. The only time you ever pay me anything is if I sell you something. And I'll be very transparent about what you're paying or who's paying it and how much it is. Because one, that's the law. And two, I think it's important to be honest and, and credible. So uh, I would just say for any of those that of you that think this fits, uh, my office is in Lapine. I think my contact information is somewhere on the U. Um, I'm happy to come to you with COVID. It gets a little stressful, but I've got a big conference room that's separate from the rest of the, the offices where we keep, you know, that's where we bring people in. So um, we can be safe or we can have a phone, you know, conversation on the phone. Um, I just have to be very careful in how I answer questions um, because there are so many regulations around presentations about things like this. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Karen. It's been great having you here. And that was a lot of good information. Um, and thank you all for joining. I we'll hope to see you at the next Sun River U class. Yes, thank you all for joining. Oh, I appreciate your time. By the way, this was recorded and will be on the Sun River U YouTube channel. Um, maybe not tomorrow, but by the day after for sure. So you can, if anybody missed part of this or wants to look at it again, it'll be there to watch at any time. Thank you much.